Good morning. You're listening to Retake Our Democracy, a 30-minute weekly show that airs at 8.30 a.m. each Saturday morning on KSFR 101.1 FM, your public radio station. And I'm Paul Gibson, the host of Retake Our Democracy. Last week, we aired an old broadcast, an interview with Tina Cordova, founder at, uh, for the Tularosa Basin Downwinders Consortium. Tina is a tremendous spokesperson for what is truly a shameless a neglect of a community that has paid a very high price for US war military policy, a price that has never been acknowledged, much less rectified. And it wasn't something they exactly signed up for. You can find that interview in all of our old shows by going to retakeourdemocracy.org, clicking on the actions and events menu in the bar, menu bar, and retake conversations is near the very top of the page. And there you'll find all of our old shows, including today's. And today I'm going to be speaking with Seneca Johnson and Miguel Acosta, staff from one of our favorite ally organization, EarthCare, who also launched Yucca, Youth United for Climate Crisis Action. We'll have lots to talk about related to national, state, and local issues, but first a few short announcements. Just to keep our listeners, listeners posted on my progress and recovering from my July 21 stroke, I continue to improve by the day with, the, with increased stamina and more clarity being the most prominent improvements. The speech, occupational, and physical therapy I receive at Christus St. Vincent's is central to my continued improvement. But none of this would be possible if it weren't for Roxanne, who ignored my, I'm fine, don't call 911, please. Um, those were my pleas. A full recovery would not be remotely possible because Ro unless Roxanne had acted quickly as she did. I am told that I should have a full recovery. Thank you, Roxanne. One day at a time and we forge on. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that we are conducting this interview on stolen Tewa land and to thank our Tewa neighbors for being such good stewards of the land. I also want to remind you that the 2022 legislative session is a bit over two months away, and Retake will be operating our legislative alert system again this year. As in the past, if you signed up for our alerts, anytime one of our transformational bills is scheduled for a hearing, we send you an alert that includes a summary of the bill's speaking points and contact info for your legislature, legislator. This year, in part due to the stroke, limiting my capacity, we will limit the number of bills we support to far fewer than the 45 we supported last year and the 65 we supported the year before that. We don't want to spread ourselves too thin. You can sign up for the alerts by going to our homepage at retakeourdemocracy.org and look for the red sign up button on the right side of the homepage. If you're interested in learning even more about how the legislature works and how you can raise your voice effectively, you should participate in our weekly legislative huddles that will begin in the first or second week of November. Zoom strategy huddles are held every Friday from 3.30 to 4.30. These sessions are really important opportunities for you to learn how the legislature really works and where the levels of levers of power really are and how you can advocate effectively in that environment. You can sign up for these sessions at our homepage. Click on NM legislation in the uh, menu bar and sign up, uh, and a sign up link can be found at the top of the page. And we have finally, we have an important update on our work on the PM Avangrid merger. Roxanne and I were both fed up with PM's I'm in ads, ubiquitous on the airways. We bridle every time we see one because they are use paid actors to parrot misinformation about the benefits of the proposed PM Avangrid merger. And just because they have more money than God and no scruples about lying and spreading misinformation, the power of money can paint a bleak reality, a rosy future, and make a something that is false appear true. It pissed us off. So we decided to produce our own retake video, I'm Out, using volunteers to provide real information on who Avangrid Ibadrola really is and why this merger would be so catastrophic for New Mexico. On Thursday, October 14th, we published a post that included the, the video and outlined all that is wrong with the deal and how public power would be a far greater, greener, uh, more democratic alternative. On, and with a, a, a public power 
New Mexico would be able to harness its own um, wind and solar and, and export it to other states and even to Mexico. Um, but a study would need to be conducted to, to lay out the feasibility of how that would work. And that's something we're at, we'll be advocating for in the 2020 legislative session, 2022 legislative session. So if you're interested in getting more involved in uh, our huddles, just go to our page and sign up and you can be part of that. Um, and if you, if we're asking people when they get the uh, blog about the uh, merger to please share it broadly on your Facebook, Twitter, what, Instagram, whatever you, social media you utilize, the, the impact of this will be far greater if we uh, have large numbers of people forwarding it to the PRC members. That's more than enough announcements for now. Let's get started. Welcome Miguel and Seneca. I always love being done with the announcements. Um, it's good to see both of you. How are you? Thank you, Paul. Uh, great to see you too. Uh, really great to see you. Okay, so um, <clears throat> fair disclosure, Miguel is actually on the board of Retake Our Democracy. So I won't throw him any difficult questions. I always like to let our guests introduce themselves. So can you tell us just a bit about yourselves and how you find your way to earth care, yucca and climate justice advocacy and fill us in on how you became involved in this effort. We'll start with Seneca and then Miguel. All right, well, hello everyone. My name is Seneca Johnson. I use she, her pronouns. I'm from the Muscogee and Seminole nations and I grew up here in Santa Fe. So growing up, I think I always cared a lot about a lot of different social justice issues, but I didn't really have an avenue to to do anything about it. I just kind of grew up having all of these like, you know, um, I don't know, this, this desire to do more, but I never had an avenue to do so. Um, and then around 2016, I got involved with um, community organizing, specifically youth community organizing um, around uh, gun violence and gun control. And that uh, has introduced me to kind of, um, I guess the larger network of what community organizing can look like in, in Santa Fe. And so from there, some of my friends had been involved uh, with Earth Care um, and they spoke really highly of it. And so I ended up uh, applying for their um, uh, Puente Summer Leadership Academy in 2019. And there they were able to like really break down issues that, um, you know, on like why they were happening, who they were benefiting, what systems they're under. And then we got to talk about solutions as well as like, you know, if we can imagine a better future, how can we get there? And that was really, really impactful for me. So I've um, been with Earth Care ever since then. I wish they'd had an Earth Care when I grew up. It <laughs> jump started me quite a bit. I didn't find my activism until I was damn near 70. Miguel, how about you? I came to uh, Earth Care uh, via Chicago. Born and raised, um, and like they say, got here as soon as I could, right? <clears throat> Born and raised in Chicago, grew up, uh, you know, among the unions and and the activists and the civil rights uh, struggles of the of the 1960s. Uh, and my earliest experience um, in any kind of uh, like El Puente, any kind of youth leadership or or development was uh, was hosted by the Southern Christian Leadership Conference uh, in Chicago right after. Uh, the assassination of um, Martin Luther King, the assassination of Fred Hampton and Mark Clark, uh, and uh, and all the the craziness uh, that was uh, being happening to our communities back then. So I've been involved in, in anti gentrification and anti racism, uh, in immigrant rights uh, and environmental justice issues since then. Although we didn't call it environmental justice then, uh, what got me most directly connected was that, and and we're celebrating this now, the 30th anniversary of the people, the first um, uh, people of colors uh, environmental justice leadership summit that happened in Albuquerque 30 years ago. Uh, that's really what got me um, most directly engaged in environmental justice work here in, in, uh, in New Mexico and ultimately you know, the connection uh, here in Santa Fe with Earth Care. Okay, great, great. So some of our lead listeners may not know what Earth Care does. Uh, can you fill us in on the important work it does? Uh, historically, Earth Care uh, has done work around environmental awareness, uh, sustainable, uh, ed sustainability education, uh, and most importantly, leadership development. Uh, the, the byline has been, you know, leadership development from the bottom up, from the ground up, I mean, um, uh, with the focus on transformational change, community uh, transformation. 
uh, over the years, it's uh, shifted and focused more and more on, um, on equity and, and um, anti-racism and, and, um, and social justice. And most recently, uh, our work has shifted also, and, and, mo and mostly youth-based, right, youth-focused. Uh, most recently, we've uh, included uh, family leadership development as well. And those are our two major areas now, youth leadership development and family leadership development through, a, through several different campaigns. Okay, so as soon as uh, Seneca gets back from trying to tame her dog, by the way, this radio show is a dog friendly radio show. So if, if your dog barks or jumps up on your lap, that's fine. How about if you take Yucca since uh, you're the youth on the crowd? Sure, yeah. Yeah, I'm glad it's dog friendly too. I have three dogs and they all love to bother me right when I'm doing things. So, um, it's their job. Yeah, so, <laughs> Uh, Yaka um, was born out of the El Puente Leadership Academy that I mentioned before. So this was in 2019. And, um, you know, it was a group of, I want to say like 25 or 30 youth. Um, who I think we, again, we had all kind of cared about these issues. Some of us had a background in it. In it some, some of us were just like being introduced to it. And the El Puente Leadership Academy, as um, you know, was able to really break down these issues. Um, and, and, you know, our own um, ways of getting involved in community organizing. And I think through Earth Care, um, a lot of people were able to see like the power that we have um, as a community and especially as youth um, to provide the sustainable future that um, a lot of us are terrified that we won't have. So about 10 or 11 youth came um, along with Earth Care staff uh, ended up creating Yucca out of um, the El Puente Leadership Academy. And at first we were organizing um, as a Sunrise Hub, though you know we pretty uh, quickly established ourselves as Yekka. Um, um, and we first organized around the September 24th global climate strike that was happening. Um, and at first everything was kind of focused all towards that. We did a lot of research, uh, sorry, uh, research and outreach to schools, to um, the local businesses and community members. And we got a couple thousand people um, at the September 24th climate strike. And just seeing all of that, um, you know, that momentum and that community involvement and that, um, you know, desire that we all have for a green and a livable future. Um, you know, we didn't want to let that momentum go to waste. We, we saw the potential that was there. And so from then on, we've been organizing um, around, you know, both like policy issues and some issues that are like on the ground um, in order to, you know, do whatever we can and um, really hold our elected officials accountable towards creating, um, you know, a sustainable and green and livable future, as I said. Green, sustainable and livable would be a, a good combo. We're not headed in that direction, unfortunately, right now. Mm -hmm. um, now that we're all oriented and up to date, what is Yucca's focus right now and what are you working on? And how, how do you go about expanding your base of young people? Because you've got, you had 20 or 25 to begin. Is there any in, intent to like establish chapters in other parts of the state or anything like that? Yeah, so that's something that we've, we've talked about before. So right now, um, Yucca is uh, mostly just based in Northern New Mexico as that's where most of our uh, members are from. Although we've had some people um, you know, down in Albuquerque and, and also like in Socorro and other places who uh, attend our meetings and hear about our work and are interested in joining as well. Um, and so let's talk, you know, for the future, but uh, for now we're mostly still focused on Northern New Mexico and our, um, I think we still haven't really strayed from our original demands, you know, for a just transition away from oil and gas um, to stopping our dependency on oil and gas revenue in our state and for a comprehensive, um, for comprehensive climate legislation to achieve 100% renewables by 2030. So um, that's kind of been our over, overarching focus um, with a lot of like smaller things that fall underneath that. Mm -hmm. um, and our target has mainly been the governor. Uh, we just uh, a couple of weeks ago did a climate strike. Um, it was the two year anniversary of the one that Yaka was formed around. And we had several hundred students at the roundhouse that were still demanding um, for fossil fuels to be left in the ground and for us to really um, think about the, the impacts and the cost of inaction, not just in New Mexicans, but um, you know, nationally and globally. Because I think a lot of times people only think about like our, our domestic emissions 
and they don't think about like how much CO2 is being added um, with all the barrels of oil that we export, not just the process of taking it out of the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's some of the things that we've been doing recently. But as you mentioned, we've also been um, focusing a lot on like onboarding new people. I think um, something sometimes uh, young organizations or organizations that are mostly youth focused have to deal with like the original groups that are growing up, going to college, going um, into the workforce and aging out. Um, but we've been able to, through our actions um, and through outreach to schools and at community events, we've been able to continue to really grow um, our base because, um, I mean, this issue doesn't go away. I think students um, will, will be, you know, scared about the future of our, of our planet um, for decades and decades to come because of the state that we're in now. Um, well, so, I'm yeah. going to get back to you later, Seneca, to ask you a bit more about that and your reaction to what's going on nationally or what's not going on nationally. Um, but first, bringing it to Santa Fe, has Yucca Earthcare taken a position on the mayor's race? Uh, Earthcare hasn't. We're a uh, C3, so we don't um, uh, get involved in that, you know, that kind of directly in terms of um, uh, endorsing or, or what have you. What we do uh, recognize <clears throat> is that whoever wins the election, whomever wins the election, the work is still the same for us. Uh, it's still going to be, you know, trying to get uh, administration and, and other leadership at the, at the city to uh, recognize uh, the importance of investing in young people, investing in families and investing in neighborhoods, as opposed to investing in corporations, consultants, and nonprofit tiers. Uh, that we need to build uh, our base uh, as a community. We need to bring folks together. Uh, around real values uh, and principles here in Santa Fe for uh, sustainable uh, development and just development and anti-racist um, development uh, for all folks. So the work will be the same, whoever wins. Um, that's, that's our position and, and we're in, in touch with all the candidates asking them to take, um, commit to that kind of work. And of course they have, they always do. <laughs> it's yeah. uh, post-election that that starts to get problematic. Right, right. Um, has Yucca Earthcare been involved with the Midtown development? And if so, how? How has that process improved or has it improved? Uh, so what good. is your view on where that might be headed? So we've been involved since the beginning, right? Um, since before uh, the current sort of manifestation of, of engagement. Uh, we responded to the original li very limited outreach that the city did. Um, uh, though, as you say, you know, the, the claims are different. Uh, and because of our response, and it wasn't us, we we're in support. Uh, it was several uh, community organizations that came together, right, to, to crit critique the original uh, process and to uh, advocate for a more open, more inclusive, more democratic process. And as a result, um, with the, under the leadership of Chainbreaker and, 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 uh, and ourselves. Uh, we've been able to expand the process uh, through the ups and downs of their own um, engagement with developers. Uh, we've been able to establish a, a, a broader process right now with five organizations participating along with, with UNM's uh, Design Center, uh, <clears throat> Design um, EPAC. Um, and uh, so it's, it's moving along. There's two parallel processes right now. There's one uh, that the city is coordinating with a couple of consulting, uh, like engineering architectural organizations. Mm -hmm. And they're looking sort of at the, at the horizontal development uh, that has to happen, right? You know, the land uh, uh, zoning, uh, the land preparation, uh, you, you know, the infrastructure, those kinds of things. And, and, and the rest of us, we're working on the other process along with EPAC from UNM uh, on um, the kinds of things that people want to see on that campus, right? The kinds of development that people, that communities might want to see uh, based on our own outreach, based on our own experience and based on our own people's plan uh, that came out of uh, uh, a summit that Chainbreaker hosted a couple of years back. So it's moving, it's moving summit. along. Right? It's moving along so, and we've got this, this, um, this Saturday, was that today, right? Today, uh, when this airs, there is a, a block party happening at, at Midtown campus. So come on over from 10 o'clock till 5 p.m. 
uh, come on over. Lots of nice activities and fun activities and an opportunity to uh, give some um, input. into. You can the send me some information about that, Miguel. I'll put it in a blog for Thursday. I will. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Roxanne and I will be out of town. And so we'll I'll send that. that. But uh, I, I think that it was your Earth Care, Yucca, and Chainbreaker that were really the reason why there's a much more open process now than there was originally planned. Um, yeah, and this, and this, this uh, by the time this airs, we will have spoken uh, and worked with several hundred students in high schools mm -hmm. around Santa Fe to get their uh, input also into this process. Did you hear the, uh, Roxanne was telling me that there's something I think in the paper maybe today, this is being now Monday, because um, we're, we're recording this on Monday for Saturday's show, um, something about the city hall moving to Midtown. Have you Heard that, that. That's, a, that, that's something that's been thrown around um, since the beginning, right? And even prior to, to Midtown, the, the, there was a conversation about moving, consolidating city offices and services over to where the Siler Yards is being developed. Um, so this became, uh, when, when, the, when they bought this property, this became then the new sort of maybe location, right, for, for consolidating uh, city services and offices. <clears throat> The concern, right, is because that they say, you know, we can consolidate there and then all those, you know, hundreds of other places where we have uh, uh, current offices, we can then sell that. Uh, our preference would be that those other spaces that they uh, maybe uh, move out of, uh, that that be uh, kept in, in the public domain, maybe as, you know, part of a community land trust uh, right. rather than selling it, selling it off to developers. Right, right. So the, the, the high school effort, are you involved in that, Seneca? Uh, yes. So me and another Earth Care staff member are, will be going in um, on Tuesday and Wednesday to speak with students and to, you know, talk with them about what makes them, you know, connect with Santa Fe, what makes them love Santa Fe, and um, then talk about what some of the barriers that are kind of like in the way, like threatening that connection they have to Santa Fe so that we can, you know, start building up their vision, as, as Miguel said, to what they would want in a space like Midtown. Okay, I've got to take a quick break. I should have done it a while ago. And just to remind our listeners that they're listening to KSFR 101.1 FM, uh, your Santa Fe public radio station. And it doesn't run on uh, pure volunteers, although I'm certainly a volunteer, but they have paid engineers and they have a studio and rents to pay and things like that. And, um, you know, it, it, it's at times like this when so much misinformation is constantly broadcast across the airwaves that an, a station like KSFR is so important because not only their news, but programs like this get you information you're not gonna necessarily find in traditional media. So if you've got some spare cash, go to ksfr.org, click on the donate button, and make a, a contribution and view it as your ticket for admission to some great programming. Thank you. All right, we're back to uh, our conversation with Miguel and Seneca. Um, this one's for you, Seneca. You were talking about, you know, the motivation for becoming involved in Yucca being to advocate for a sustainable, livable future. How, what is your reaction to the inaction you see in Washington around this? Um, we've just gotten the IPCC, another IPCC report, very doom, very gloom, um, but also pointing out what needs to happen. And it's like they got their feet embedded in concrete. How does that make, I'm not asking you for a solution to that. I'm asking you, how does that make you feel? Um, I mean, it's incredibly frustrating. Um, like, I don't know, it, it feels like, um, you know, we've been doing this work for I mean, I've been doing it for several years and I recognize people have been doing it for decades and decades ahead of me, but I mean, behind, or yeah, but it still feels like we're like shouting into the void almost, <laughs> like we're jumping right. through every hoop they ask and it still feels like we're barely moving an inch. Um, and so it's incredibly frustrating, especially seeing that like there's, I might be only a, you know, a few people that are, um, you know, holding up so much progress um, right. Right. Keep decisions. And it's just incredibly frustrating the more and more I learn about it. Yeah, it's a, it's a frustrating and it's to commend you for continuing at it. And I know Yucca's focus is local, not necessarily just Santa Fe, but uh, 
northern New Mexico and New Mexico. And that, that's the choice that Retake took um, because there, there we felt like we had, we were close enough to the levers of power that we could actually have an influence. Um, sometimes I doubt that, but um, we're still trying. But on a national level, I know we don't. And so um, we got to hope that some of these national leaders start to behave like adults. Um, yeah. Or sooner or later, some folks like you are going to really get mad and it's going to get ugly. <laughs> <laughs> so um, as a follow up to that question, given adult equivocation on climate and all things racial justice, how do you keep your spirits up and what actions do you think youth can take to move the needle? Um, I mean, as far as keeping my spirits up, I think sometimes it's it's something I've struggled with in the past, uh, specifically after legislative sessions. Um, because, you know, this work is, um, as I mentioned, it's incredibly frustrating um, and it's constant and it's very easy to burn out. But um, I think the main, probably two things that have helped me um, would be finding community with other people who are able to like, um, understand these issues and like why they matter, why they're frustrated whilst, um, you know, still giving me like a time away. It's important to say to, I'm not sure how to say this, this work is part of like everything that we do, but it's important to like also have time to like, you know, reset and recognize for yourself. And so being able to find other people, especially in this work who understand how draining it can be, it's been very helpful. And also just understanding, um, whose shoulders I stand on. I think uh, something that I hear a lot is, you know, be a good ancestor. Um, and that's something that I really take to heart because I know that the only reason I can be here today is because the people before me have given absolutely everything for me to be able to, to be here, for me to have the opportunities that I have now. And so, you know, it really feels like we owe the future generation the same, the same chance, the same opportunity. So we have two or three more questions, but we only have about one more minute. So I want to uh, ask one of you to let people know where they can find out more information about Earth Care and Yucca and how they can contribute to its work. And then we'll take a pause, let the radio show end, and we'll go back to our questions. Uh, Earth Care, the nm.org, that's the best place to, to find us. And, and through that website, you can also uh, contact uh, or get in touch with Santa Fe Mutual Aid. Oh, that's a great organization. You guys did a great job starting that. And Yucca? Uh, our Instagram is yucca.nm. So we post about actions, ways to get involved. Uh, we also have our website, uh, yuccanm.org, and our email, yucca at earthcarenm.org. Okay. Well, thank you both for that. And thank you both for being with us today. Um, I want to mention that. Next week on Retake on the radio, we will have James Jimenez, um, the ED, Executive Director for uh, Voices for Children, certainly one of the great allies, our closest allies, right up there with um, Earth Care and NECA. Um, they do great work. And I just completed that interview a little bit ago. And uh, it's, he, he really is a great interview and knows his stuff about taxes. So uh, I encourage all of our listeners to tune in. And that's it for today. Um, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay active. That's the most important part of that because that's the only way we're going to fix this mess. See you next week. Okay, we're back by the miracle of podcast. Um, we had just heard from uh, Seneca about how she keeps her hopes up and her spirits up and keeps at it. Um, I wanted to ask Miguel a question. Has there been any headway in relation to Yucca Earth Care efforts to address a gentrification and inappropriate exploitive development in the South Side? Uh, there's been progress and there's also been new challenges. <clears throat> uh, the progress uh, that we've made is, um, and Seneca was a big part of this as well, that we finally had a groundbreaking in our teen center. Uh, so there's finally going to be a structure and hopefully some investment, more investment in, in, uh, in youth on the South Side. We're working uh, actively to make sure that it's youth-led, youth-managed, youth-inspired, um, and, uh, and, and, and youth-approved uh, uh, programming and, and, and work out of the, out of the teen center, uh, although there will, all, will also be multi, 
uh, generational were coming coming out of there as well. Uh, we've moved into a larger space, which makes it uh, easier uh, for us to expand our work. Uh, so we've got a convening space now that that's uh, uh, more you know much more conducive to, um, to building community building based on the, on the south side. And this past um, summer, we were uh, we won designation as a Main Street project, Airport Road. So we've got a Main Street project now for Airport Road that should be kicking off here in a few weeks. Um, <clears throat> and um, and you know, it's an 18 month uh, campaign to redesign, rethink, uh, reimagine Airport Road, uh, not as a, a throughway or a highway, but as a connector. Uh, even using like imagery of like acequias, right? So it becomes a space that we all have a responsibility to, uh, and that gives us uh, something as well. Uh, and so all the connected neighborhoods and communities and and arterials, uh, or not arterials, all the side streets and and uh, and neighborhoods coming into Airport Road will be a part of designing <clears throat> uh, sectors of Airport Road that are that are sustainable, healthy. Uh, just uh, that contribute to uh, quality of life, uh, affordable housing, economic development, et cetera. <clears throat> None of it will be, uh, you know, the city or county, nobody's required to act on any of those, but we're hoping to come up with some really good uh, ideas for, for the kind of development that we'd like to see, the communities would like to see up and down Airport Road. <clears throat> I was just um, going to ask you, you don't have to have any kind of approval process from the city or the county not not for this this is all just you know um communities coming together to dream right um you know we're, we're not going to be doing any tearing down or building up of anything until you know hopefully these projects will will get lives of their own and and uh, and uh, and morph into like real developments right that so that's part of it designing the vision but bringing people together building capacity building organization uh, and and hopefully uh, you know have three or four projects that we can get behind. Is this an earth care yucca led if effort? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So so and we'll be inviting everybody in and, and hopefully get a lot of uh, public conversation, public dialogue. Um, you know, one of the good one of the positives, if you can call it a positive, but one of the things that happened because of the pandemic is that there's been a lot of there's been an increase in digital skills, uh, virtual skills. So we'll be able to do a lot of this virtually, right? Get people engaged in virtual design charrettes and, and what have you, right? Uh, so it's exciting. Uh, it's exciting. It, we also had uh, uh, the Bureau of, uh, what's it called? Um, the Air Quality, it, it, the Environmental uh, Improvement Board. They've agreed to hear our appeal about the asphalt plant. Uh, so come, February, we're going to have another three-day hearing around uh, the consolidated asphalt uh, plant and its impact on our communities and hopefully uh, environmental justice and community health will prevail this time. Uh, the challenges that have developed over the last um, couple of years, uh, and, and it was actually made worse by the pandemic, was an increase in, in construction. So it seems like every single empty space on the south side, there's apartment uh, or condos going up. Uh, there's always a claim of affordability, but it's affordable to whom, right? That's always the, the, the question. Right. Uh, and and um, it's just, you know, some ridiculous decisions, but there's no, you know, and the city just, you know, divested in long-term planning, neighborhood uh, planning, uh, you know, all these things that would make, um, that would support communities having like a parks plan, right? A quality of life plan, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, all those things that other parts of Santa Fe have, uh, we have none of that on the south side. And it's come to, it's become real apparent uh, just in the last few weeks when all of a sudden an, an open space that communities and neighborhoods around um, the area have been working on for 20 some years, right? All of a sudden it got, it's getting yanked out from under them or there's a threat of it being yanked out from under them uh, in a sale to a, a local developer who wants to put condos and a charter school there. So not just undermining uh, the work that, uh, that those neighborhoods have done for all these years, uh, but also you know, more development um, in an area that already has too much um, and a charter school that will undermine uh, our local public schools and further uh, segregate education here in Santa Fe. Uh, that's been, it was sad to see that happen, uh, but communities and organizations have, have rallied in the, every single uh, 
early notification meeting, there's been like 80, 90 people speaking and all of them have been opposed. Uh, so we're putting pressure on the city and the county. The county offered that land as part of the annexation. The county offered that land to the city with the, with the requirement that it be parked, right? And they had promised to keep that land as park or open space when they were talking to communities about the annexation. Isn't that the land you and I talked about in terms of getting the county to commit the land and then use yeah. that to do a park yeah. expansion and other yeah, things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they had, apparently they offered it to the city and the current administration said they didn't want it. Uh, they already had enough parks to manage. Of course, they're all in District 1, uh, or <laughs> District two, but that they already had enough park land to manage and they didn't need any more. Um, now they're claiming that that never happened. So they must have had the Nixon secretary uh, erasing tapes or something like that because now yeah. they're claiming that that meeting never happened. Uh, but in any case, yeah, that that's uh, that's been part of the challenge, is all the new construction, new development, and um, and uh, and the threats to even some of the amenities that we have. So we've got a couple more questions. One um, is related to the chart. Have you been involved in the chart at all? The, the plan to do something with the obelisk on a long-term basis and, and cultural iconography and so forth throughout the city? No? I think we've no. left that to some of the more like indigenous-led groups because although we sent, like to center indigeneity and we have a lot of like indigenous people within, um, I think other groups like have people that are like necessary. Um, you know, it's very culturally important, like to them, and it's it felt important that they are the ones to to handle it. So, of course, we'll support however we can, but um, other groups are leading this effort. That's precisely why retake took a step back as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and um, you know, and, and the timing people. of yeah, and the timing of it was also um, part of the the decision to you know we, you know during a camp during campaigns and elections and all that. It, it just wasn't a good time for uh, engaging in anything like this. Right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll see what happens. They certainly saw what happens if you don't do anything. That's uh, right. That was what happens. Um, so the, the one last question is whether or not you've taken a position on and are engaged in the work against the Avon Grid p and merger. Seneca? Uh, yeah, so we are opposed to the Avon Grid merger for, um, you know, a number of reasons, as I've, you know, heard that you uh, made that video earlier, uh, I'm sure you know, but um, I mean, I feel like Avon Grid and Iberdrola is, we just can't trust New Mexico's energy future to them. Um, I mean, even just looking like, well, internationally, I know they've had um, allegations of corruption and bribery, even just nationally, like looking at Maine when they overtook um, that uh, major energy company there. And I know they've had like, they've become number one in outages. Um, they've had a lot of like long lasting outages. Customers have had to take them to court over improper billing procedures. And the fact that like that could be coming to New Mexico and that, um, it, I don't know, it, it's terrifying that to think that people are like, oh, this might be a better alternative. And that, that there's so much misinformation going around. Um, and so many commercials that I've seen that are all for it that doesn't acknowledge any of the, I don't know, very obvious negative um, impacts. Um, also just looking at the Four Corners power plant, I know that it is um, like a key part of this merger to um, trans, uh, not just close down the Four Corners power plant, but like transfer it over to NTEC. Um, and, you know, we're calling for a full closure. Um, and you know to see that it would just be kept open that much longer that rate payers would have to continue paying for um, irresponsible decisions of PNM and PNM wouldn't even have to deal with it anymore. Um, and we're going to continue to like pollute the earth. <laughs> and of course, uh, Avon Grid has not agreed to pay for any of the cleanup for either the San Juan generating station or Four Corners power plant. Like this deal is bad for any number of reasons, and so we we oppose. Well um, put. Well put. Well, I want to thank both of you for being with me today um, uh, and wish you the best of luck in your continued work because what you do is, is like the soul of Santa Fe or what should be the soul of Santa Fe. And, uh, and I've been a long time supporter of uh, 
Earth Cares work and now Yucca's and the, um, the Mutual Aid Society was a brilliant idea. How much are you distributing to people through, and how many people are involved in that effort? This past year, uh, it was a half a million that we were able to redistribute. Uh, and this is neighbor to neighbor for the most part, right? Uh, there, were, there was a few foundation grants, but the, the majority of the money was from neighbor to neighbor. Uh, and that includes uh, over $100,000 uh, that, was, that was earmarked for folks that didn't qualify for federal support because of undocumented status or, or what have you. Um, so half a million dollars and, uh, and we're, still, we're still at it. So if anybody still wants to contribute to Santa Fe Mutual Aid, our, the current uh, project or work that we're doing is, is uh, uh, responding to the city's invitation for suggestions on how to spend the $15 million that they're getting. Uh, and we're advocating for you know, a low barrier, low threshold direct support for families. Uh, which is what we found that worked best for you know for Santa Fe Mutual Aid rather than these lengthy applications and then two months of waiting, right? Um, so you know direct support for families, investing in 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 neighborhood people, right, to be the the the, the navigators, helping their neighbors and helping others access the resources that are available, and and long term investments, in, you know, in, in youth and families and communities. Um, that that will help us build better resistance and resilience should something like this happen again, right? In terms of an economic shutdown. Um, that's great. So there's Half some a million dollars. Answers. That's hard to believe. That's just incredible. Yeah. yeah. You know. Um, so thank you to work. all of Santa Fe and our friends everywhere for for contributing. Yeah. Well, we'll continue to promote it, and we contribute. Roxanne and I do. So oh, thank you. good luck, continue that work. That's just so, so important. And it's such a great model of, you know, one organization just saying, wait a minute, we got to do something. And instead of trying to do it all themselves, just lay out a platform that allows neighbors to help neighbors basically. And that, that's wonderful. Yeah. That's local power. So yeah. thank you both for being with us today. And- Thank uh, you and good, good to see you doing so well. Thank you for all you're doing for coming back so quickly. Thank well, you, I'm sir. trying. I'm trying. It's not always easy and it's not always as polished as it once was, but polish is overrated. Um, <laughs> so thanks again. Thank you. Be well. See, see you.